look, let's look at uh, terrestrial-based observations, part five. When I first got into this, uh, people, of course, immediately, the knee-jerk response is, you're an idiot, you're a moron. What the heck, man? If you've ever been to the beach, you have seen the curve? <laughs> Sorry, I, I have to do that every now and then. It's cathartic for me because that's what I hear in my head now. Every time people start saying stuff like that. Anybody else relate to that? <laughs> Maybe a little bit. Yeah, they're telling me, okay, if you've ever been to the beach, you've seen the curve. So I start going to beaches, start taking lots of pictures, start bringing them into Photoshop, put a parallel line over it. No, it's flat. So that I'm in Malibu, and I go climb the top of a high mountain in Malibu looking out there. That's about 100 miles across right there. Took a picture of it again, straight. Went down from Malibu to meet a friend. It's a writer helping me with my seed project. And he grew up in Ventura, in the Ventura Beach area, and he was a lifeguard growing up. And he tells me a story about looking out and seeing the Anacapa Arch. The arch itself is about 40 feet high, and the inside of the arch, from the water to the inside of the arch, is about 25 feet. It's about from where he was, he said it was 20 miles away. And he said he could see the thing. So he, that's what got him thinking. He saw me posting stuff on Facebook and stuff, you know, people seeing stuff they're not supposed to see. And he's like, wait a minute, I've seen the Anacapa Arch, and that's 20 miles away. So he went to a friend of his at a university that uh, teaches math, and he said, okay, you know, we're on a globe approximately 25,000 miles in circumference, right? Yeah, okay, what's the math? Yeah, you know, averages out to about 8 inches per mile squared. Okay, cool. So if we're looking out at an object 20 miles away that's 40 feet high, should we be able to see it? And he did the math up on the board, taking into account observer height and all that kind of stuff. No, shouldn't be able to see it. You know, so you're saying we should not be able to, not impossible, should not be able to see it. He said, well, the problem is, dude, we've all seen it. And the guy's like, what do you mean? He's like, the Anacapa Arch. All of a sudden, you're hearing the... Uh, Flintstone sound effect, you know, when Fred had something happens to him, he's like, <laughs> the math professor's looking at the board, uh, you know, looking at his own math, and something's up there, I don't know. Started having a lot of those types of experiences, <laughs> both myself and with others. Met a guy at a conference, he came up to me, he was a, a professional surveyor, and uh, he says, I gotta show you something, dude. And he shows me his surveyor book, it's first order level book. And under the formula for figuring out curvature and refraction at the top there, it says, rules for applying curvature and refraction when trig leveling. Subtract curvature and refraction on the back side, add curvature and refraction on the foresight. <laughs> what? <laughs> you know. So then I have people say, well, if you've ever flown in an airplane, you see the curve. <laughs> I'm in airplanes all the time, I'm traveling all over the world, doing conferences and all kinds of stuff. So I start taking pictures out of the airplane, every altitude that I've been at, take pictures of it, bring it in the Photoshop, put a line on it, flat. I'm going, well, and, and then again, you know, I'm, I'm searching online and looking for, there's got to be some kind of proof out there for the globe that I can latch onto, right? So you find all these videos like, top 10 proofs why we know the Earth's a globe, and they're coming up with stuff like this. Number three, the horizon. Ships on the ocean or tall Chicago buildings viewed over Lake Michigan disappear bottom first. And you can see the sunset twice if you watch it lying down and then quickly stand up. The simple fact is, if the Earth were flat, there wouldn't be a horizon beyond which things could disappear. So from across Lake Michigan, you'd be able to see all of Chicago, as well as the Rocky Mountains. If the Earth were truly flat, there would be really hardly any limit. You'd be able to stand at the top of the Empire State Building and look towards Chicago, a mere thousand miles away, and see the lights of Chicago at night. Really, dude? Scientists, you notice. That's a scientist there. One of the things, the criticism I hear about this conference and stuff is, well, there's not a scientist among them, no PhDs. Look, I consider that an advantage, frankly. <laughs> because, because, the stuff I hear from PhDs is not impressive to me, <laughs> you know? Uh, you know, here's this guy he's saying, he, you know, he's claiming to be a scientist and saying, I should be able to see Chicago from New York. You know, there's this crazy thing in between us called the atmosphere. Look it up. <laughs> Dude. Wow. Um, it's for an example of why ships disappear hull first and why you miss the lower parts of buildings. Come see me at my table back there. I've got a little show and tell for you to show you how it works. Uh, and it came as a result of this guy right here. <laughs> this picture, and of course you saw this in Jake's uh, trailer there earlier. 
This picture came out right in the beginning of our, our whole sort of awakening in 2015. Joshua Nowicki snaps a picture of Chicago skyline from the other side of Lake Michigan, sends it into the ABC News affiliate. Weatherman does this whole thing about saying, you know, we should not be able to see it. You know, the only way you'd be able to see it is like higher up you know, out in space looking down. He says, so what you're seeing here is a mirage. That poor guy had no idea how famous he was about to become. <laughs> He's just a weatherman, just doing his thing. <laughs> Next thing you know, flat earthers are all over the poor guy. <laughs> uh, now, of course, when I first saw that, I'm like, I'm like, you know, mirages are wavy, distorted, upside down. You know, that does, that's not a mirage. You know, and Rick said the same thing. And then Rick told me, because uh, he lives in that area, Rick Hummer. And he's like, you yeah, know, I've seen Chicago my whole life. I'm like, really? People have seen it? He's like, everybody's seen it. So he started driving out there to the location. Hello? Okay. <laughs> I'll just stand like this for a little bit. Um, so yeah, uh, Rick starts going there and uh, taking pictures, and then he starts talking to police officers on duty and getting them to... <laughs> like, wait a minute, how can we can see Chicago, you know? Like, everybody can see it. So I'm like, Rick, man, I mean, we started talking. We're like, we need to come up with a way of uh, proving this, you know? And so we're thinking, you know, the best thing to do, I, in my mind anyway, was to rent a boat, get in the thing, and drive out there and shoot it the whole way, you know, on a clear day. Because my thinking was, if it's a mirage, then as we're driving close to the city, it's going to magically disappear, and then the city will roll up over the ball, and there it is, you know? If it's just the city just is there, it's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger in the camera, which is exactly what it did. But we still had to explain why the lower part of the city was missing. Because uh, people, when they saw my video, you know, Rick and I, it was about a year, a little over a year later, we finally went out there and did the test, and I put out this video that really went viral. Rob Skiba proves the Chicago skyline is not a mirage. Um, we learned a lot of things on that trip. Um, like the haze that's at the bottom there, that's obscuring a, a significant amount of the lower part of the city. And of course, as you get further back, 46 miles or so, it's compounded all the more. But when we uh, finally found it, I mean, it took a year to save the money to get a boat captain willing to do it and weather conditions and all that stuff. So it took a while to get out there. Meanwhile, the, the weatherman uh, had been getting so much flack for this whole thing, you know, online. Uh, he went to an optics professor at a university and the optics professor corrected him, said, well, technically it's not really a mirage, it's more like looming, which I guess is part of that whole category of, uh, you know, atmospheric uh, conditions or whatnot, distortions and what have you. Uh, so he starts to explain it. Now, I was very thankful that he did that because that was almost exactly a year to the day that he got the uh, photograph that they did the news report. And right about that same time is when we were doing the trip. Now, when we did the trip... Uh, people are like, aha, Skiba approved it's a globe. See, you're still missing the lower part of the city. So, you know, ipso facto, therefore, you know, uh, it has to be a globe. And so, you know, at the time we did the trip, it, on one hand, we felt like we had a victory. On the other hand, uh, we felt like, no, not really, because it's inconclusive. We're still missing the lower part of the city. So what's going on? Well, here's a clip from the, um, the uh, talk that the weatherman had with the optics professor, and then some of the conclusions I came to as a result of it. So uh, is all this under mirage and then looming is under mirage? Or, or what, what, what are the uh, semantics of, of looming versus mirage? OK, well, um, th that's all, uh, I guess that's all in the, in the details of the, uh, of the terminology. Um, and uh, from what I understand, technically, I think mirage has to have an inverted image, uh, whereas uh, there are other atmospheric effects such as looming or towering that are purely displacement and, and you don't necessarily have to have to have an inverted image in order for uh, refractive effects to occur in the uh, in the atmosphere. So they would all fall under the category of atmospheric refraction. I guess that, that's that would be a good uh, a good thing to say. Yes. OK, so again, this is their graphic. We you know, according to them, we know the Earth's a ball, so therefore, this is the way it's working. Chicago's over here on the left, we got the curve of the Earth here, and the light rays, which would normally be going straight across, uh, have to be bent due to the atmospheric lensing, the uh, density of the atmosphere and whatnot, causing the light to refract downward, basically just conveniently enough over the top of the bulge of the, of the curve, so that we can see it on the other side. Now, here's where I would differ with this whole idea. Again, just sort of flipping the board. Let's just say 
we don't start with any preconceived notions of the Earth as a globe. Let's entertain for a moment the completely absurd notion that water is flat and it always seeks its own level. And we're looking across a flat plain of water, 46 miles across. Check this image out right here. Now, I caught this image shortly after Rick and I returned from our trip across the lake. Uh, we grabbed a bite to eat, and then we went out to the beach, and it was still clear out, so we got the camera out and looked 46 miles across the lake to see this right here. This image is extraordinary. Okay, The boat right here, I'm going to guess, is less than a mile away. And I base that because these people walking in front of the camera here are walking across some rocks that sort of jut out and, and kind of fence in the um, harbor area. And they are uh, only about a quarter of a mile away from where we were when I shot this. I shot this image from right about here. This is where we were uh, looking across, and this is the area right here where those people were walking. And the boat, as you could tell uh, by the size of the people on the boat, wasn't too much further beyond that. So maybe a half mile to a mile, or at the most, I would say, away. All right, now when I was headed back to Chicago to catch my flight, I snapped this picture of the Willis Tower. And this is, if you go on Google Earth, uh, this is right about the area right here where I believe I, I was when I took that picture. Looking across, it's only about 0.6 of a mile. So I'm just a little over a half mile away. And look at the size of the tower as compared to the car that was diagonally in front of me. We were looking at the Willis Tower from this direction right here when we were on the other side of the lake. Now, okay, so let me slide the car over and shrink it down to the appropriate scale beside the boat. Do you see something rather interesting here? This building is significantly magnified. The image on the left shows the size and scale of the building next to a car at 0.6 of a mile away. The image on the right shows the same building and the same car with a boat at 46 miles away. The atmosphere really is acting like a lens. What type of lens? A convex lens or a magnifying glass. So I'm going to suggest this is what's happening. The atmosphere is acting like a lens, which magnifies the city, brings it up, little closer and as it does so we start to lose a little bit of the bottom of the buildings and perhaps due to uh, the density in the atmosphere there's an additional refraction in, that takes place that makes it drop down even more huh just like we saw now this is a still frame from the half hour video that I did and uh, the numbers you see there are all based on the numbers that Tony was giving me based on his device uh, his device said it was 37 nautical miles, which was 42.6 statute miles. But when you plot the same exact location that we were at, the exact distance you get on Google Earth is uh, 46 miles. So you basically add about four miles to all the numbers that you saw in the half hour video. But here's where it gets interesting, at least to me. Both of these pictures were taken with the same camera from the harbor area here. The red line at the top is where we were in the boat. We're just about to depart when I asked uh, Tony to stop and I got the camera out to shoot Chicago. And the uh, lower red line is where we were on the beach when I took the picture on the bottom there. Now, here's the shot uh, from the beach before I zoomed in. Now I'm zooming in, zooming in, zooming in, and I'm gonna stop it right about here. That's about halfway on the zoom, and I believe that's where Rick had the camera set when he took the picture above, based on the size of the building right here. I'm going to guess that he was about halfway. All right, so let's go ahead and continue the zoom. And this is zoomed all the way in. The Nikon Coolpix P900 has an 83 power optical zoom, and that little punch in after that was the digital zoom afterward. Uh, it has a digital zoom that goes beyond the 83 power. So gonna guess it's probably 
the equivalent of about maybe 90, 90 power zoom or so right here. Now let's bring the picture in from the halfway zoom and I'm going to go ahead and bring our car back in and slide the picture in from Chicago and so you got three different zooms here one almost completely zoomed out one zoomed about halfway on an 83 power optical zoom lens and uh, the one on the right of course all the way zoomed in uh, with a little touch of digital zoom on top of that in the camera and when looking at these images compared to the one on the left which is just shot with my iPhone I, I'm I gotta tell you, it looks like it's being magnified to me. Especially when you consider the fact that that building is like 45 miles away from that boat. It's 45 miles away. So, it looks like there's some serious magnification going on here. And, you know, some of that could be due to the lens, I'll give you that. But I also know what I could see with my own eyes. Now, I understand you may not want to take my word for it, so all I can say is go up there and do it yourself. <laughs> but uh, based on my, what I saw with my own eyes, as well as what the quote-unquote experts had to say regarding how the atmosphere can act like a magnifying glass, I'm still going to go with it as being magnified. There is a lot of water in our atmosphere. But I'm thinking... If the atmosphere, especially over water, is made up of zillions and zillions of tiny convex drops of water, then collectively, perhaps they all combine to make one big convex lens, in which case it would act like a magnifying glass. Okay, so with that in mind, let's look up some websites dealing with the refraction of light. You might see a graphic, something like this, showing light bending downward, just like the weatherman guy said. And here's your typical graphic showing how uh, light rays entering some sort of medium, like in this case water, refraction causes the light to bend downward. Now we've all seen pictures of, you know, a pencil or something in a glass of water and how not only does refraction bend the image downward, it also magnifies it. So this is important now. And let's just go back and hear from the experts once again what's happening with the atmosphere. The science is the same of that of a lens. Here's a simple example. So if you're looking at, at uh, Chicago here, just maybe you can, now you can just see the top of, mm -hmm. uh, of the Sears Tower. And if our simulated uh, temperature inversion moves into place, hopefully now you can see all of, pretty much all of yeah, Chicago, see all the lower buildings. Including, including what's at ground level. So the atmosphere really is like acting like a lens. Yes. Again, based on that imagery that I saw looking 46 miles across versus 0.6 miles across, uh, I really do believe, that just like the experts said, the globalist guys, these, these are people who believe in the globe now. They are the ones that said, hey, the atmosphere really is acting like a lens, and they put a lens in front of the camera to show how it works. So I'm, I'm just doing what they're doing. Uh, using the sheet right here, set the city up, a little cut out of the city, and now I've got the big magnifying glass sheet bring the camera right up to the lens. See, that's the normal view of the city. Now let's back up again. The science is the same of that of a lens. Here's a simple example. So if you're looking at, at uh, Chicago here, the atmosphere really is like acting like a lens. Yes. Atmosphere really is acting like a lens. And this is how much of the city is missing due to the lensing effect, the magnification uh, of the atmosphere. So thinking about all this and thinking about what I had just shown you regarding atmospheric lensing, magnification, refraction, all that with regard to cities and uh, objects at a distance on the land, I got to thinking, well, I wonder how this would work with the sun and moon. So this is what I came up with. I've got my magnifying sheet frame and I created a, a little stand uh, to paste the sun on it and keep it the same height over the flat surface of a table. So the sun is always going to be parallel with the surface. And uh, check this out. All right. Here's the first test of a sun moving over a flat surface. And with no atmospheric magnification, it does what we might expect it would. It gets smaller as it goes away from us. All right. Now let's see what happens when we add in our atmospheric magnification. Again, water and refraction 
Water causes magnification and refraction, right? So let's bring the sun back. Oh, check this out. Refraction bends the light downward. <laughs> it made the sun set on a parallel surface. As it was moving parallel, the same height, the whole way over a flat surface, the refraction caused the sun to set. Not only that, well, let's uh, bring in the beginning of that little test, and we see that it maintained pretty much the same size, too. And, of course, that's because as it's moving away, the magnification is, is still uh, taking place. And so, even though the sun's further away than it was in the beginning of the test, uh, the magnification basically preserved the same size, and the refraction made it set. Of course, again, depending on how much moisture is in the air, we could see that the sun doesn't appear to change in size at all as it goes down. We could see sometimes perhaps that it looks like it's getting bigger when it goes down. You ever see like a really big sunset or moonrise, moonset, you know, where one of them looks really large on the horizon? Well, that could be because there's lots of moisture in the air uh, causing that effect. Or when there's less moisture in the air, obviously you won't have as much magnification taking place and so it looks smaller as it goes away. So it's all relative to the amount of moisture that's in the air. Now I'm just going to put forward a crazy idea for you to think about. And that is, <laughs> if Rob Skiba could figure this out, I'm just, I'm, I'm just going to go out on a limb here. I think it it's quite possible that the creator of the cosmos could have figured out the same thing and engineered our beautiful sunsets, thanks to all that water he placed in our atmosphere. Just something to think about.